Hi, welcome back. Um, in this segment, we will continue reading Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, starting with chapter 16. Chapter 16. As no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr. Collins' scruples of leaving Mr. and Mrs. Bennet for a single evening during his visit were most steadily resisted, the coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to Maryton, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing room, that Mr. Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation and was then in the house. When this information was given and they, and they had all taken their seats, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment that he declared he might almost have supposed himself in the small summer breakfast parlor at Rosings, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification. But when Mrs. Phillips understood from him what Rosings was, and who was its proprietor, when she had listened to the description of one, only one of Lady Catherine's drawing rooms, and found that the chimney piece alone had cost eight hundred pounds, she felt all the force of the compliment, and would hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing to her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine and her mansion, with occasional digressions and praise of his own humble abode, in the improvements it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentlemen joined them, and he found in Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it all among her neighbors as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but wish for an instrument, and examined their own indifferent imitations of china on the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt that she had neither been seeing him before nor thinking of him since, with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the shire were, in general, a very credible gentleman-like set, and the best of them were of the present, were of the present party. But Mr. Wickham was as far among them all in person, in countenance, air, and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing port wine, who followed them into the room. Mr. Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth was the happy woman by whom he finally seated himself, in the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night, and on the probability of a rainy season, made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair, as Mr. Wickham and the officers, and Mr. Collins seemed likely to sink into insignificance, to the young ladies he certainly was nothing, but he had still at, inter he had still at intervals a kind listener in Mrs. Phillips, and was, by her watch watchfulness, most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffins. When the card tables were placed, he had an opportunity of obliging her in return, by sitting down to whist. I know little of the game at present, said he, but I shall be glad to improve myself, for in my situation of life, Mrs. Phillips was very thankful for his compliance, but could not wait for his reason. Mr. Wickham did not play at whist, and with ready delight as he was and with ready delight was he received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker, but being likewise extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes to have attention for any one in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear he, she could not hope to be told the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. She dared not even mention that gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and, after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. About a month, said Elizabeth, and then, unwilling to let the subject drop, added, he is a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand. Yes, replied Wickham. His estate there is a no noble one. A clear ten thousand per annum. You could not have met a, more, a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, 
for I have been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy. Elizabeth could not but look surprised. You may, be well su you may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as you probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy? As much as I ever wish to be, cried Elizabeth warmly. I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable. I have no right to give my opinion, said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I am not qualified to form one. I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It is impossible for me to be impartial. But I believe your opinion of him would be in general would in general astonish, and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else. Here you are in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighborhood, except in Netherfield. He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everybody is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favorably spoken of by any one. I cannot pretend to be sorry, said Wickham, after a short interruption, that he or that any man should not be estimated beyond their deserts. But with him, I believe it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and see him, sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man. Wickham only sh shook his head. I wonder, said he, at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he is likely to be in this country much longer. I do not at all know, but I heard nothing of his going away when I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans in favor of the Shire will not be affected by his being in the neighborhood. Oh, no, it is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him, but I have no reason for avoiding him but what I might proclaim to all the world, a sense of very great ill usage and most painful regret, re regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best man, men that other, ever breathed and the truest friend I ever had, and I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved to the soul by a thousand tender recollections. His behavior to myself has been scandalous, but I verily believe I could be, I could forgive him anything and everything, rather than his disappointing the hopes and disgracing the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject increased, and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented farther inquiry. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics. Meryton, the, ne the neighborhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, and speaking of the latter especially, with gentle but very intelligible gallantry. It was the prospect of constant society, and good society, he added, which was my chief inducement to enter the Shire. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable corps, and my friend Denny tempted me for it farther by his account of their present quarters, and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintance Meryton had procured them. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment in society. A military life is not what I was intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession. I was brought up for the church, and I should at this time have been in profession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we were speaking of just now. Indeed! Yes, the late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next pre presentation of the best living in his gift. He was my godfather and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He meant to provide me, he meant to provide for me amply, and thought he had done it. But when the living fell, it was given elsewhere. Good heavens! cried Elizabeth. But how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did you not seek legal redress? There was, such an in, there was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honor could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Dowsey chose to doubt it, or to treat me as a merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by ex extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, as exactly I was as I was of an age to hold it and that it was given to another man, 
and no less certain is it that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper, and I may perhaps have sometimes spoken my opinion of him and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse, but the fact is that we are very different sort of men, and that he hates me. This is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other he will be, but it shall not be by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Elizabeth honored him for such feelings, and thought him handsomer than ever as he expressed them. But what, said she, after a pause, can have been his motive? What can have induced him to behave so cruelly? A thorough, determined dislike of me, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better, but his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given to me. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this, though I have never liked him, I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him to be despising his fellow creatures in general, but I did not ex suspect him of descending to such malicious revenge, such inju injustice, such inhumanity as this. After a few minutes of reflection, however, she continued, I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the impossibility of his, resent of his resentments, of his having an unforgiving temper. His disposition must be dreadful. I will not trust myself on the subject, replied Wickham. I can hardly be just to him. Elizabeth was again deep in thought, and after a time exclaimed, To treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favorite of his father. She could have added, A young man, too, like you, whose very con countenance may vouch for your being amiable. But she contented herself with, And one, too, who had probably been his own companion from childhood, connected together, as I think you said, in the closest manner. We were born in the same parish, within the same park, the greatest part of our youth was passed together. Inmates of the same house, sharing the same amu amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession which your uncle, Mr. Phillips, appears to do so much credit to, but he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy, and devoted all his time to the care of the Pemberley property. He was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most intimate, confidential friend. Mr. Darcy also often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest obligations to my father's active superintendence, and when immediately before my father's death, Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me, I am convinced that he felt it to be as much a debt of gratitude to him as of affection to myself. How strange, cried Elizabeth, how abominable. I wonder that the very pride of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to you. If just if from no better motive that he should not have been too proud to be dishonest, for dishonesty I must call it. It is wonderful, replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. It has oft it has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling. But we are none of us consistent, and in his behavior to me there were stronger impulses even than pride. Can such abominable pride as this have ever done him good? Yes, it has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor. Family pride and filial pride, for he is very proud of what his father was, have done this. Not to appear to disgrace his family, to, to degenerate from the popular qualities or lose the influence of the Pemberley house is a powerful motive. He also has a brotherly pride, which some brotherly affection, which with some bro brotherly affection makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you will hear him generally cried up as the most attentive and best of brothers. What sort of a girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy, but she is too much like her brother. Very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. But she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about fifteen or sixteen, and I understand highly accomplished. Since her father's death, her home has been London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her education. 
After many pauses and many trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help reverting once more to the first and saying, I am astonished at this intimacy, at his intimacy with Mr. Bingley. How can Mr. Bingley, who seems good humor itself and is, who seems good humor itself and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in a friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please where he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can be a, com com a conversable companion if he thinks it worth his while. Among those who are at all his equals in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him, but with the rich, he is liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honorable, and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gra gathered around the other table, and Mr. Collins took the station between his cousin Elizabeth and, a and Mrs. Phillips. The usual inquiries as to his, as to his success were made by the latter. It, not, it had not been very great. He had lost every point. But when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, that he considered the money as a mere trifle, and begged she would not make herself uneasy. "'I know very well, madam,' said he, "'that when persons sit down to a card table, they must take their chance of these things, and happily I am not in such a circumstance to make five shillings any object.' There are undoubtedly many who cannot say the same, but thanks to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, I am removed far beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr. Wickham's attention was caught, and after observing Mr. Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation were very intimately acquainted with the, lady, with the family of de Bourgh. Lady Catherine de Bourgh, she replied, has very lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You do know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Bourgh and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters, consequently that she is aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, indeed, I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. Her daughter, Miss de Bourgh, will have a very large fortune, and it is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile, as she thought of poor Miss Bingley. Vain, indeed, must be all her attentions, vain and useless her affection for his sister and her praise of himself, if he were already self-destined to another. Mr. Collins, said she, speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter, but from some particulars that he is related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in a great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for, for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictator, dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she der derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, apart from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nep nephew, who chooses that everyone connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to cards and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr. Wickham's attentions. There could be but no conversation in the noise of Mrs. Phillips' supper party, but his manners recommended him to everybody. Whatever he said was said well, and whatever he did, done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but Mr. Wickham and of what he had told her all the way home, but there's not time for her to even mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr. Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets, of the fish she had lost and the fish she had won, and Mr. Collins, in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, enumerating all the dishes at supper, and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had more to say that than he could well manage before the, before the carriage stopped at the Longbourn house. Chapter 17 
Elizabeth related to Jane the next day what passed between Mr. Wickham and herself. Jane listened with astonishment and concern. She knew not how to believe what Mr. Dar or that Mr. Darcy could be so unworthy of Mr. Bingley's regard, and yet it was not in her nature to question the veracity of a young man of, of such amiable appearance as Wickham. The possibility of his having really endured such unkindness was enough to interest all her tender feelings, and nothing therefore remained to be done but to think well of them both, to defend the conduct of each, and throw into account of and throw into the account of accident or mistake whatever could not be otherwise explained. They have both, said she, been deceived, I dare say, in some way or, or other, of which we can form no idea. Interested people have perhaps misrepresented each to the other. It is, in short, impossible for us to conjecture the cases or circumstances which may have alienated them without actual blame on either side. Very true indeed. And now, my dear Jane, what have you got to say in behalf of the interested people who have probably been con concerned in the business? Do clear them, too, or we shall be obliged to think ill of somebody. Laugh as much as you choose, but you will not laugh me out of my opinion. My dearest Lizzie, do but consider in what a grace disgraceful light it places Mr. Darcy to be treating his father's favorite in such a manner, one whom his father had provided to has promised to provide for. It is impossible. No man of common humanity, no man who had any value for his character, could be capable of it. Can his most in intimate friends be so excessively deceived in him? Oh, no. I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on than that Mr. Wickham should invent such a history of himself as he gave me last night. Names, facts, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr. Darcy contradict it. Besides, there was truth in his looks. It is difficult indeed. It is distressing. One does not know what to think. I beg your pardon. One knows exactly what to think. But Jane could think with certainty only on one point, that Mr. Bingley, if he had been imposed on, would have much to suffer when the affair became public. The two young ladies were summoned from the shrubbery where this conversation passed by the arrival of some very persons of whom they've been speaking. Mr. Bingley and his sisters came to, gave, came to give their personal invitation for the long-expected ball at Netherfield, which was fixed for the following Tuesday. The two ladies were delighted to see their dear friend again, called it an age since they had met, and repeatedly asked what she had been doing with herself since their separation. To the rest of the family, they paid little attention, avoiding Miss, Mrs. Bennet as much as possible, saying not much to Elizabeth, and nothing at all to the others. They were soon gone again, rising from their seat with, with an activity which took their brother by surprise, and hurrying off as if eager to escape from Mrs. Bennet's civilities. The prospect of the Netherfield Ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the family. Mrs. Bennet chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter, and was particularly flattered by the receiving by receiving the invitation from Mr. Bingley himself, instead of a ceremonious card. Jane pictured herself to be a happy evening, or pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of her two friends and the attentions of their brother, and Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr. Wickham, and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr. Darcy's looks and behavior. The happiness anticipated by Catherine and Lydia depended less on any single event or any particular person, for though they, they each, like Elizabeth, meant to dance half the evening with Mr. Wickham, he was by no means the only partner who would satisfy them, and a ball was at any rate a ball. And even Mary could assure her family that she had no disinclination for it. While I can have my mornings to myself, said she, it is enough. I think it no sacrifice to join occasionally in evening engagements. Society has claims on us all, and I profess myself one of those who consider intervals of recreation and amusement as desirable for everybody. Elizabeth's spirits were so high on the occasion that though she did not speak that she did not that though she did not often speak unnecessarily to Mr. Collins, she could not help asking him whether he intended to accept Mr. Bingley's invitation and if he did, whether he would think it improper to join in the evening's amusement, and she was rather surprised to find that he entertained no scruple whatever on that head, and was very far from dreading a rebuke either from the Archbishop or Lady Catherine de Bourgh by, by venturing to dance. 
I am by no means of opinion, I assure you, said he, that a ball of this kind, given by a young man of character, to respectable people, can have any evil tendency. And I am so far from objecting to dancing myself, that I shall hope to be honored with the hands of all my fair cousins in the course of the evening. And I take this opportunity of soliciting yours, Miss Elizabeth, for the first two dances especially, a preference which I trust my cousin Jane will attribute to the right cause, and not to any dis disrespect for her. Elizabeth felt herself completely taken in. She had fully proposed being engaged by Miss... Miss... I'm sorry. She had fully proposed being engaged by Wickham for those very dances, and to have Mr. Collins instead. Her liveliness had been, never been worse timed. There was no help for it, however. Mr. Wickham's happiness and her own was perforce delayed a little longer, and Mr. Collins' proposal accepted with as good a grace as she could. She was not the better pleased with this gallantry from the idea that it suggested of something more. It now first struck her that she was selected from among her sisters as worthy of being the mistress of Hunsford Parsonage, and of assisting to form a quadrille table at, at Rosings, in the absence of more eligible visitors. The idea soon reached to conviction as she observed his increasing civilities towards herself, and heard his frequent attempts at a compliment on her wit and viva vivacity. And though more astonished than gratified herself by this effect of her charms, it was not long before her mother gave to her to un gave her to understand that the probability of their marriage was exceedingly agreeable to her. Elizabeth, however, did not choose to take the hint, being well aware that a serious dispute must be the consequence of any reply. Mr. Col Collins might never make the offer until he did. It was useless to quarrel about him. If there had not been another field ball to prepare for and talk of, the younger Miss Bennets would have been in a pitiable state at this time, for from the day of the invitation to the day of the ball, there was such a succession of rain as prevented their walking to Meryton once. No aunt, no officers, no news could be sought after. The very shoe roses for Netherford, Netherfield were got by proxy. Even Elizabeth might have found some trial of her patience in weather, which totally suspended the improvement of her acquaintance with Mr. Wickham, and nothing less than a dance on Tuesday could have made such a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday endurable to Kitty and Lydia. That's the end of chapter 17. Um, we will pick up chapter 18 in the next video.